Welcome to our Q&A for Coming Home Again with Outsider Pictures. I'm Robert Rosenberg. I'm based in Miami, Florida. I'm a filmmaker, film programmer, and I work with Outsider on most of their releases. Our website is outsiderpictures.us and our social media handles are mostly at Outsider Pictures. You can follow what we're doing, but you also can, if you haven't yet seen Coming Home Again, click on our website and purchase what's called a virtual ticket, which will give you a chance to watch the film from home. Um, if you've seen the film and you love it, tell your friends, you're our best publicist. It'll be up all week and probably for a number of more weeks at over 70 different cities. You buy it through a specific theater link and it supports them as well as the work of the film. A few theaters around the country are open and showing the film in person and that's indicated as well for those who wanna go out and see it the way it was meant to be seen on the big screen. And we will talk for a while among ourselves, but there's a Q&A box, not the chat box, in the Q&A box, anybody watching can uh, put your questions in there and you don't have to wait till I say now I'm open to questions, just put your questions in there and we'll follow up on them as we get to them and to the topics. Also, we realize that some of you have maybe didn't see the film yet since it just got available to the public yesterday. So we'll not, we'll try not to give away spoilers, though it's not that kind of film that we really have to worry so much about spoilers, but hopefully this will illuminate the film for you in advance or afterwards if you've already seen it. So a big welcome to our illustrious crew today. Um, I want to welcome director and co-writer uh, Wayne Wang. He is the renowned director of films like The Joylight Club and Chan is Missing, which I'm old enough to say I saw when it was released originally as well. And <laughs> um, the co-writer of the film um, coming with, with, to us from Italy, Chang Ray Li, whose original New Yorker article is the basis for the film, and he co-wrote the film with Wayne, and chef Corey Lee, whose restaurant venue in San Francisco was awarded three Michelin stars and is working on other projects now that he can tell you about as well. So I'm gonna to try to um, go between all of you, but feel free to, anybody has something to say on a particular question to jump in as well. Um, Wayne and Chang Ray, can you talk a little bit about the genesis of the project in terms of the New Yorker article, Wayne, how you got the idea for the film and decided to collaborate? Well, I'll let uh, Chang Ray uh, talk about how he started or when and how he started writing the short story that got published in the New Yorker. Because uh, it's pretty biographical if I'm, if I'm correct, yes? Yeah, it, it, well, it wasn't a fiction. It was a, a nonfiction piece that uh, the New Yorker asked me to write. And, and they asked me to write something about uh, my time at, at uh, boarding school. Uh, I went to uh, Phillips Exeter in New Hampshire. And, and I remember thinking, oh, sure, I'll, you know, write about that time. And, you know, I didn't really have a topic for it. But, um, but I said yes. And suddenly, you know, once you get the commission, uh, you have to start really thinking about it. And as I thought about it, I, I really didn't know, you know, what the whole time was about. You know, I was thinking more about the school itself and my time there and my studies. And, but, um, but what kept coming up, I think, uh, time and again, when I thought back to that time were all the times that my parents visited and all the, all the, uh, all the moments that my, that we shared on those visits and then all the moments that we shared when I went home. I wasn't very homesick when I was there and yet this is what I remembered. And so some of the, some of the, you know, if you would call them scenes from my life or became scenes in that piece, uh, were really just focused on, you know, our eating together, cooking together, um, uh, you know, spending time together in, in the context of not having been together. Uh, and, and so that's what I ended up writing about, which uh, of course led to what was happening in my life at that point, or it just had happened a few years before, which was my mother was dying of cancer. And she died in 1991. Um, and I think it was, it took me, you know, that long, I wrote the essay in 1995. Um, 
it took me that long to, you know, just process everything and be able to write anything about it. Um, and so when, when this, uh, you know, opportunity came up to write a piece, I thought, well, I guess that whole time for me at, at that point in my life uh, was really about uh, how, uh, uh, how much I missed my mother uh, back then. Um, and, and obviously how much I was missing her right at that moment and still do. You spent almost a year at home taking care of your mother when you found out that she was sick, yeah? And all that time you were also cooking with her and, and all that? Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't home uh, every day of that year. Um, I would probably go home for three months, go back to New York for a month. Um, I was pretty much just shuttling back and forth. She lived in upstate New York and, and I had quit a job on Wall Street and that I was just in the job for a year and uh, I was trying to write, I was doing odd jobs, I was doing freelance work. And um, so it was, and my sister was working in her first job. Um, my father was, you know, still busy with his. So um, I just thought it just seemed to make the most sense. And of course I wanted to um, just go home and, and spend time with her. So Wayne, can you talk about what about Chen Ray's story inspired you and said, hey, I want to make a film inspired by this and collaborate? Um, well, I, I, I didn't read the article when it first came out. I got attracted to uh, Chen Ray's novel, uh, A Gesture Life, uh, which probably came out in the late 19... Uh, 1999. Yeah, 1999. And I started working with Chang Ray on adapting a script for that. And in the process, I started reading his other stuff that he wrote before. And this was one of the, one of the stories that I wrote that really kind of hit me pretty hard at that time, even though both my parents were alive and were well. Um, but then six or seven years ago, my mother started getting, well, she got sick with Parkinson's for a while, but she started getting um, uh, more sick around that time. And, and my wife and I were taking care of her and a lot of this came, came back to me. Uh, but the film didn't happen until, you know, Don Young from Cam came to me and said, you know, uh, my grandmother passed away. We have a really interesting apartment in, in uh, Russian Hill, and it feels like the apartment from Chang Ray's uh, 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 short story. And, and I went to see it and I just felt the spirit of something there that resonated with the short story, that perhaps there was a reason for it to, to be used this way. And we put together a very small independent crew and shot the film. So Chang Ray, I'm, I'm curious as a well-known writer of fiction, was this your first film, I mean, to really work on it and be, get to the screen in terms of collaborating on a script? And how is that a different kind of writing than the writing you usually do? Oh, definitely. Uh, this is the first, uh, you know, many of my books have been optioned and, um, but this is the first one that, that, that you know, actually came, came to life. But but I, I must say that, you know, this was a, because of the way that the film, um, things got together when and I had just, a, you know, a casual conversation, I remember over a sandwich at uh, uh, Beat Patisserie or something. And, uh, and he said, let's do it. And, um, you know, we talked through ideas. And, uh, and I guess when I, I was out of town, and, you know, Wayne's schedule was, so, it was such a quick, kind of guerrilla shoot um he shot the whole thing <laughs> and, and <I> remember, <laughs> you know we hadn't written anything you know i mean a lot of the film i mean i think most of the film is just wayne and the actors blocking things out improvising you know just just going through you know all their interpretations of, of the piece and obviously taking the piece which is a non-fiction piece and using it as the, a launch pad for whatever's going to happen in the story and with the characters. Uh, 
I came in later um, after, you know, uh, I guess the first cut and, you know, Wayne and I talked about certain things that the film might benefit from. And so I ended up writing a few, you know, maybe four or five scenes for the, for the, for the, for the film. I, I don't know if those might be the actual only written parts of the film. <laughs> I, maybe you can, I, cause I never saw any other script, but and yeah. maybe you guys were working off of something. I, I don't really know. Yeah, well, we were, I started, uh, well, Chang Ri was very generous. I mean, he, he went out of town and he said, you know, do whatever you guys want to do. Um, I always kept him updated on everything, but, but we did take uh, a lot of dialogue from the short story itself and created maybe six different dialogue scenes. And the rest of the scenes were all what I call process scenes, like cooking scenes and things like that. Uh, but, you know, Chang Rei had some input on these scenes. Uh, but, you know, by the time he came home, it was all shot. And we realized <laughs> we didn't have enough, uh, especially towards the end. And uh, so it was really important. The, the, it's actually, it, it became six different scenes that he wrote for us after he came home. Uh, he sat down with the actors, we had, we had a meeting, and he wrote like six different scenes. And those scenes were very specific because they were also scenes after we had seen a cut and we knew what we were lacking or missing. So anyway, that's a, that's a more kind of detailed explanation of, uh, of the script part, actually. Well, I want to get to the food, since food plays such an important role in the movie, and Corey is sitting right here. Um, Corey, can, can we start with you first to talk about what was it like? I, I read some interesting comments from you about like kind of recreating a Korean kitchen in a, an old apartment that had been really an older Chinese American woman's um, home, and just the whole process of trying to move authenticity of the food and the cuisine into the story and the texture of the film a little bit. Yeah, well, I think um, uh, if for people, and this is not just like a Korean American thing, but for for people who have emigrated from their homeland to a, to a new country um, and trying to maintain some kind of identity um, to their native culture, I think food plays such a, a big role in that. And certainly, for the Korean American experience of, of people who moved here kind of in the time of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, I think there are common things that, that we all share, um, whether it's working with certain kinds of products or seeing some very familiar brands or some kitchen tools because um, they were quite limited. So whether you were a Korean American family um, living in, in the East Coast or in LA or somewhere in the South or in the Midwest, I think that there are certain things that um, are kind of staples in, in, a, in a Korean home. And I wanted to make sure that it felt that way and, and there were some recognizable things. Um, that's different from a Chinese um, kitchen. And so when I first walked into the apartment, for me, it felt very much, um, it felt foreign to me. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a big student of Chinese cooking as well, so I understood what I was seeing, but it still didn't feel like the scene I imagined in Chang Rei's story when I had read it, um, and I was trying to fill the set with some of those some of those visuals. And and also coming up with a menu was really important because uh, you know I I didn't really have an idea of what really we should cook. The food uh, the 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 menu in in the short story was kind of mixed. It had some it had some smoked salmon, it had some this and that, uh, but I wasn't completely happy with that because I wanted something a little more homey and traditional and and Corey maybe can talk about that and how you kind of came. Yes, I think I, I think I read Chang Rei's story maybe uh, maybe three times over the years. Um, the first time I read it, it was it was many years before I, I even met Chang Rei. And then I read it again after meeting him and spending some time with him. And then um, probably the third time, right before we started working on this, when I talked to Wayne. Um, and there are some uh, very descriptive 
um, um, parts of the story that talk about certain dishes. And I think um, Wayne had an idea for some of what those, some, what those dishes would be, for some of them at least. And then for the other ones, it was trying to find um, some, some way to sh uh, for people to relate to these dishes, even if they were in Korean. Um, and then also for, for those who are watching the film who are Korean, see dishes that they recognize and kind of be able to relate to the experience of preparing them at home for, for certain occasions. Um, yeah. So they're very homey dishes, but they're also dishes that you don't eat every day. Some of the uh, photos you sent us, like, you know, prepared photos of some of the dishes that you would have made for the film. And those were probably our most popular social media posts. They sort of explain <laughs> what on our posts are very popular. Media. Yeah, but I think there, there are Korean dishes that you eat kind of um, on a, a kind of an everyday casual meal. And then there are certain dishes that you would have on, on holidays or when you have uh, guests over. Um, but they're also recognizable. Um, and so I think we tried to focus on some of those dishes. Wayne, I think this is a good moment to ask a question that um, I guess people probably always ask you as a well-known Chinese American, but Asian American leading director taking on a specifically Korean story like this. What were your thoughts? Did you think, oh, I can't do this, or of course I can do it with Jang Ray? I mean, how did you come to this particular, the specificity of this story as a director? Well, I, I was pretty careful to try, you know, in terms of the script, always show Chang Rei what I was doing so that he could correct me. And there were a lot of places where he, he did that. And again, with the food, which is so important because the whole story is about uh, the son cooking the New Year's Eve dinner uh, that was exactly the New, the New Year's Eve dinner that the mother used to cook for them. Uh, so I wanted all the food to be very specific and, and as Corey says, recognizably Korean and yet at the same time, you know, uh, people could, 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 it's universal for, for other people who are not Korean would say, oh yeah, uh, galbi, the short ribs, uh, the, the, uh, the glass noodle chop chae dish. These are really classic and yet specifically Korean. Uh, so that's kind of how I work with everything. And on the set, there were, there were two people uh, working with me who, who were Korean and constantly were saying, well, we wouldn't have that painting there. Let's switch out this painting. We wouldn't have this there. So it was all done in a way to kind of make it at least uh, as close to uh, authentic as we can. I, I think that's interesting because most audiences and probably readers for books as well feel that there's a, a, a interesting universality, universality in the specificity of the story. And I think this story is so much about becoming an adult who you are and dealing with your elderly parents who are all gonna eventually pass away, and it's a universal story, but it's also very specific. I just wonder, Chang Rei, or welcome back. <laughs> and, yeah, sorry, and uh, yeah, the internet here, out here is spotty. Whether <laughs> <laughs> right. well, you want to talk about your specific approaches or cultural approaches to the ideas of family and living and dying that I feel are woven into the film so, so clearly, that are more universal than not, but are also clear, specific to cultural references as well. I'm sorry if I, uh, you know, I, I missed about a few minutes there, so I don't know what was already said, but. It was um, mostly about food, but it was about how, you know, the food is specifically Korean, but also there's a universality to it. And I think that's probably true with all three of us in some ways. I mean, we're not, we're, we're all immigrants in some ways, but then at the same time, we're also really American. And the two of them are Korean, I'm Chinese. I'm Chinese from the North, which uh, if I'm correct, is closer to the Koreans than the Chinese from the South. But anyway, I'll let, I'll let Chang, Chang Rei go on with, from there. Well, you know, I think, I think you know, the immigrant um, notion is, a, you know, uh, a key one here is 
you know, because it's not just the food. Obviously, we love food, we love sharing it, and we love its flavor. But, but you know, I think for the immigrant family in particular, it's not only an exercise in taste, right? It's it's an exercise in, you know, a certain kind of a stole of of memory and of experience uh, that maybe you know that the um, the younger generation doesn't have. It's also a way, I think, at least it was for me and my mother a way for us to communicate in ways that um, we weren't communicating uh, in, in, the, in the larger culture. And certainly we weren't communicating uh, after I left for boarding school. Um, you know, we talked on the phone, but, but the ways in which, um, you know, that, that, we could, that we could connect um, and, and, you know, it really enjoy and appreciate one another and show gratitude to one another and, um, and and show how important we were to one another weren't necessarily verbal um, and maybe that's the case in a lot of um, you know certain kinds of immigrant families it certainly was in ours um, but but the way that we did that for, 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 for me and my mother was you know through these enactments uh, which were genuine I mean it wasn't um, but it was it was through these this process of just uh, you know my watching her, her make food when I was younger, I starting to help her. And then, you know, what the story got into, what my piece got into is when I started to uh, make food for her. Of course, the irony was that, and you know, it's, it's, it's spelled out in the film that, you know, she couldn't eat it at that time. I, I have one question, Wayne, for you before we open up to some of the questions, which are sort of on the same subjects. Um, the casting of Jackie and Justin and, and the two key roles. It seems so critical to a small chamber piece like this. And how did you find them? Did you already work with them before? What was the process of getting them into the film? Well, Justin, I had, you know, known his work for a while now. And I really, you know, like his, his acting. Uh, and I know that he's also a writer director. Uh, he had just made a film called Gook and Miss Purple uh, by the time we started shooting our, our, our film. So I found that all those things were very helpful and, uh, and, and I can kind of, you know, use them uh, as I see appropriate. So, you know, the only worry I had for Justin was that he, he may not look young enough. So, but I, as, I, as I started seeing more pictures of him from the internet, recent pictures, and then also talking to him on the phone, I realized he actually sounded pretty young still and also looked young enough. So, so that wasn't a big problem. And he, he loved the idea and he loved the short story and he really wanted to work on it. Uh, Jackie was difficult to find, to find uh, the mother um, uh, who would be, uh, um, you know, old enough and yet not too old and a good actress and speak good enough English and all of that was, was really, really difficult. We went through LA, New York, looking at professional actresses and we couldn't find anybody. And finally, Heidi Levitt, who cast Joy Love Club with me, uh, said she went to a play and saw Jackie in this play and she would be perfect for this. I went down to LA, auditioned her, and felt that she was, was really right for it. We had to make her look a little older to kind of make that uh, mother and son thing a little more believable. But at the same time, Jackie wanted to make herself look good. So that was always kind of a contradiction. But anyway, it, it, it worked out. I thought, I thought she was perfect. You know, I, yeah. You know, yeah. seeing my, you know, when you did that first screening, Wayne, I, I was, it just took my breath away the way that, not that she looked so much like my mother, but, but uh, the way she carried herself and the way she spoke and uh, her kind of pauses and uh, it was just, uh, it was just amazing. You know, she, I thought she did an incredible job. I also thought uh, Chef, Chef Lee did an amazing job too. I mean, I, I, my favorite part of the film almost is just watching him butterfly, you know, the Calbi. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I wish I could have done that, you know, back then I was just butchering everything. 
um, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, actually, Corey spent two weeks with the actors every morning or afternoon, teaching them how to cook those dishes. And one of the ones that that were that were that was really difficult was kind of butterflying that short rib so that it was done just right, so that the flesh could still so be attached to the bone and look look nice. Um, right. And that became such a metaphor for the movie because the flesh, uh, you know, attaching itself still to the bone and lending the taste uh, is, is such, a, such a great way to describe the relationship between, between the son and the mother. Let's take a couple of questions from the audience. I have other questions, we'll come back to them. But um, Brandon Anna says, being a Korean American, I originally thought, how could Wayne tell the story of a Korean but then realize it's critical for our culture to be told how we look by other cultures. How important do you think it is moving forward to how films be made by cultures not from the native story to help everyone understand how the story looks from other lenses? Wayne, Chang, Corey? <laughs> Chang, you, you don't wanna answer that or Corey? Well, you know, what's interesting is the only book that I've ever seen my mother read in English is actually the Joy Luck Club. Um, so that was probably in the, in the when, when did that come, when did the book come out? In the early 90s? 80s? Maybe 80, not late 80s, maybe. Right. And, then, and when was it? Because I did the film in 94, so. Maybe eight, late 80s, yeah. So maybe even though early. that was very much about the experience of Chinese American families in kind of our area or the Bay Area, um, I mean, that's a book that my mother related to strongly enough to, to read that. And then when the film came out, it was something that we watched as a family. And of course, there are, the, there are specific differences between that experience and a Korean American family's experience, but there's some universal things there that I think we all share, trying to assimilate to a new country, but maintain our identity from our native culture. Um, so I think that Wayne understands that experience and, and um, it's really just the specific details that he might not um, have experienced, but the universalities are, are still very much there. Well, I, when I started working in Hollywood, I used to, used to be told uh, that, oh, you can't do this story because you're not American. Um, and by that time, I'd been in America for over 30 years. And I would always say, well, why, why can Tony Scott or Ridley Scott do these stories and I can't? Um, I think it, it ultimately, it comes down to being responsible about what you're doing and trying to get people who are, whether it's a Korean story or, a, or an American story, people who can uh, help you authenticate, you know, what you're, what you're doing. Like every little detail in this case, we, we, we try to make it as Korean as possible. But at the same time, people need to understand that all Asian Americans are, are pretty much all American. There's this mix of American in there with the, with the Koreanness that's in, 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 in the environment, in how they are, in their food and whatever. So, anyway, Chang Ray. Yeah, about I, I, I mean, I agree. I, I like your what you're saying about you know a certain kind of you know you want to get the details right, and I think you know it's an artistic question, which is, I think artists. I've always believed and always will believe that artists can write about and and paint about and make music about anything they wish, but they do have to get the details right. They do have to understand, they do have to do all the hard work. And then, you know, and if they do enough of the hard work, if they think profoundly enough about it, if they care enough about it, um, maybe as with all good art, it'll happen. Um, but, but again, it's the responsibility of the artist. But I would love, I, I would hate a, a society and a world in which we didn't allow that responsibility to, to, to fall on the artist. And where it was just, you know, out of an edict, cultural, or just a, just a certain kind of, um, you know, idea about who's, who, who can tell what stories, 
uh, that, that that's that's just forbidden ground, uh, and I'll never believe in that. So, and I think, and and one of the things that you know that I think Wayne has been talking about is is all the hard work that went into the story, um, the uh, details, big and small. And so, uh, so I think I think that's pro probably why films feel truthful, but then of course aren't limited to that truth, right? That's when they that's when they can expand and 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 cross over to something you know more timeless. And one of the biggest conflict that I had on the set was with Justin saying to me constantly that I was too restrained. He felt that the Koreans were much more emotionally expressive, so to speak. And that's why towards the end, in the dinner scene, in the short story, it wasn't like that, but I knew that Justin was ready to explode because he was so pent up. And he did, I mean, in one take, he actually was throwing food around. Um, I would never do that from a, Chinese culture perspective, unless you have a very, very, you know, uh, crazy temperament. Um, nor, nor would I. <laughs> what? <laughs> nor would I. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but that's the thing about this, right? I mean, it's like he, it, Justin's part of the, part of the piece, right? He's a, he's a, he is a key, key component to what, to whatever's going to happen. Um, uh, he's, and he has his own experience and that's, and that's how, you know, art is made, right? I mean, he he decided, you know, he felt like he felt the moment, went for it. Um, it's not, you know, say what I wrote back then or how I would have done it, but 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 I think for the film uh, worked out. Yeah, I agree. So let's go to Sunny Lynn has a question about the, that specific scene, the dinner scene. I thought the shot choice was interesting how instead of using a two shot, it was a single shot of the mom and we hear from the son and daughter without seeing their faces and then it's followed up with a single shot of the son. What was the intention behind those choices? Love the film. Well, it's really hard to, to cut, from my pers perspective, to cut away in a very emotional scene. I mean, Hollywood films are always intercutting between characters so that you can catch bits and pieces of reaction from the other character. But in this case, I felt that Jackie was going through so much emotionally as a character, trying to eat the Calbi but couldn't even swallow it uh, or chew it well enough. Um, I felt that there, there, there was so much going on, I didn't want to leave her. But by the time Justin reacted and, and basically lost it. Uh, I felt that the scene then became his scene. So in a way it's, 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 uh, it's, you know, deciding the whole first half is on Jackie and the whole second half is on, on Justin. So I, we didn't talk really Wayne about something that you mentioned a lot in the interviews. And I thought about, of course, when I was watching the film that there seemed like so there were some really specific, I would call classic film influences on your filmmaking here. And can you talk about that? Were there specific films you were thinking of or were they just people that you sort of like, you've in digested them as filmmakers and kind of include them in your style? Well, obviously Ozu and his films such as Tokyo Stories have influenced me for a long time. I mean, he uses the environment and the objects to sort of you know, filter the emotions or can, you know, let the emotions come through. Um, the other one was Jean Dillman. And this film, even as I was uh, trying to put together some kind of script for, for the short story, I thought of Jean Dillman because it was all about, you know, a mother taking care of her son uh, and she cooked a lot and she prepared the day for the son and it's very slow, very static. And she did the same thing for three days. And on the third day, one of the buttons fell off when she was ironing his shirt and he flipped out and, and she flipped out and basically uh, killed one of her clients uh, that day. And that's sort of the drama of the film. And it, there's something about the repetition that's important. I mean, Hollywood films would never let you 
repeat things. Hollywood films would always say, oh, the character isn't doing anything or saying anything, cut it out. You know, whereas this film, as in John Dillman or some of Ozu's film, I really stayed on the camera. I really repeated things. I wanted those things to be as much part of the film language uh, in this case. Well, somebody actually in our audience has a question about the way the film was constructed and put together. Uh, Lisa Kim says, given the non-conventional method of shooting the film, not starting with the complete script, going back and, and adding additional scenes, how did you go about editing the film? What was the process like? And did you have a Korean person on hand to help you translate Korean dialogue? Uh, I had an Irish editor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really believe that, I mean, you know, Corey doesn't hire all just Koreans working in his restaurants, even the Korean restaurants, because you do want the input from different people that you respect and you think can understand these things. Uh, but at the same time, I had uh, different assistants who, who uh, knew Korean and could help us with the little details of the language and the whatever, everything else. So uh, that's how the, uh, the, the post-production was done. Okay, um, another question I had, most people who are gonna see the film this week or the next few weeks will see it on small screens. Anything from, please know from your phone to your laptop to maybe project it on your, your larger screen TV and not in the theater. Uh, I, I assume, at least Wayne, you were at the, the Toronto Film Festival world premiere last year and you could see it with an audience on a big screen, which is very different. How do you all feel about the film because of COVID-19 mostly being released through streaming and not being able to be seen in the theater? And what's the differences? Where are movies going? Where, where are we all going as creative people and people working on film in terms of TV screens and working in the theaters? Any of you, but of course, Wayne, since he's the film director. I, I I haven't seen it, you know, I wasn't at the film festival, I couldn't go, and so I, I have not seen it on the big screen. Um, I've just seen it on my, you know, TV, um, you know, and, and a cut. I probably haven't seen the, the actual the latest cut, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> the final, final, final cut, you know, Wayne's always tinkering, but um, uh, I, you know, I, I guess, uh, you know, even before the pandemic, you know, I'm maybe typical of most people is that, uh, you know, I didn't go out, I wasn't going out to theaters the way I did when I was a teenager. Um, and, you know, in my 20s living in New York, uh, just because that was the only, even though we had video back then, I always preferred to go to the theater. And um, I guess just with the way life is and how busy I am um, um, and, you know, the time I have, uh, you know, I'm used to watching things on, on the smaller screen now, uh, which seems pretty big now. And I consider the small screen the TV. I would never watch a, a movie. I mean, I don't like watching movies on my laptop. And, and, but I think this film is, is suited to, you know, it, I don't think it really needs a huge, huge screen. Um, and it, maybe it's what Wayne was talking about, about, um, you know, it, the, the, the film is patient, you know, it, 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 it really takes in, I mean, there's, I remember certain shots of Jackie that, you know, I just couldn't take my eyes off of, and it didn't really matter how big it was or how small it was. Um, you know, the emotions, it's, it's really about, you know, can the emotions just thump at you, um, you know, in whatever format. And, and I think, and I think this, this, this film is, is fine for the smaller screen that way, because it, it does have a lot of punch to it. Um, it, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't need a lot of pirate, you know, it doesn't have lots of things going on in, in, inside the frame and it doesn't need to. Yeah, I, I agree with Chang Ray, especially this film. I think it's kind of more suited for a smaller, whether it's TV or whatnot. But as a filmmaker, I still miss the big screen and being able to see more of the details or, or kind of let your eyes wander. For example, Corey, what he did with restocking the refrigerator, it, there are moments where you can see inside the refrigerator and you can see what's there is not, 
you know, Chinese stuff, but, you know, specifically Korean stuff, some of the sauces uh, uh, in the pantry, and little details like that, you know, I, I know it's not important in relationship to the bigger emotions, but I, I, I do like to see those kinds of things on a big screen and let your eyes wander a little bit. Well, hopefully soon, or sooner, or soon as it can be, we'll be back in theaters and they won't disappear, but it's a tough moment. Um, we're getting towards the end of our time, but I wanted to give each of you a chance if there's something you want to add or that we haven't touched on or want to ask each other, please go for that now. Is there anything we've missed? Corey, anything? No, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, my role in this project is so small. And I basically coerced these guys to let me be part of it. So <laughs> I think Wayne and Chang are better. What's your, I'm, I'm just kind of curious. You have a new Korean restaurant about to open pretty soon. So what's the theory behind or what's the, what's the guiding principle behind the Korean restaurant in terms of how Korean or how American or how mixed it is? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, we talk, we talk about that a lot. And I think we even talked about it a little bit, uh, getting the dishes ready for, for this film. Um, I think that the dishes that you might have in America in a Korean restaurant located in San Francisco are not the same exact dishes you're gonna have in Korea. Um, I, I think so often people associate some kind of authenticity with something that's traditional or um, something that's an exact replica uh, that's imported in. But I, but I feel that you know, to truly be authentic in, in whether it's a dish or a cuisine or, or a restaurant, um, you have to be aware and, and embrace your location. And that goes from the people who are dining there to the products that you're working with. Um, so we want it to be a Korean restaurant that as a Korean person, you can go into that restaurant and it satiates your appetite or your desire to have a very Korean experience. Um, but we're not gonna let um, this, this, this notion of trying to stay traditional or, or importing food from our childhood as kind of the, the guide for what and how we cook. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, and that's why, you know, I love Corey's cooking. And I mean, he, you know, it's a living thing, right? It's continuing to evolve. It's, it understands context. It, um, and, and for me, I think that's what, you know, I, I, that's what one of the fun, you know, fun things about the film for, um, about this film was for me is that, um, you know, obviously I wrote a, a, a piece that, you know, has obviously about my life. But I, um, but I kind of enjoyed um, the way that Wayne and the actors um, took it in an interesting new direction and, and allowed new th things to come in that, um, you know, were shocking, exciting, um, and quite moving, you know, in certain moments for me, um, but in a different way, like where I was just a viewer of not my life exactly. And it's not, the, you know, this, this film is not my life. Um, but but in a certain way, it's it it really importantly captures, I think, you know, what what I cared about, which was you know trying to trying to revive a connection with something that that's gone. Yeah, I understand. I mean, I think I think your the short story was really a poem that you wrote for your mom, and and I think again, it's very generous of you to give me that and let me do, in a way, my poem to my mom and a little bit of Justin's also. Um, and I think that's, that's you know, and, and a film is a different thing too. It's not like a short story um, that's kind of doesn't need a lot of conflict sometimes. It's more poetic, it's more elliptical. Uh, whereas with a film, I think you, we need that focus of more conflicts and more drama that way. So anyway, I mean, I, I, the thing also, again, is to stay respectful and true to the original material, but then at the same time, sort of adding or, or polishing certain parts of it. Um, 
And that's why I find really interesting also going back to Corey's cooking. Every time we go to his restaurant venue, uh, he always claims that it's California cooking. But the more I go there, and maybe it's because it's, 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 it's me, uh, the food tastes more Korean or tastes more Asian at least. You know, some of the sauces, some of the specific dishes, maybe he's doing that just for us. But I feel like uh, his whole uh, cooking approach, even from the days uh, of French Laundry to now, I think it sort of has a more Asian feel to it in its, in its essence. Yeah. So I mean, just, yeah. I, you know, I'm not even sure what, uh, if I said it's California cooking, I, I actually don't know what that really means. Um, but I do think that, it, you know, it'd be a failure if, if it hadn't evolved or changed in some way, because I've changed you know, as, 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 a, as a chef and just as a person and the world's changed too. Um, so I think, you know, as Chang Rei was saying, that it is a living thing, um, you know, but one thing that was interesting about, about the story and, and what you guys were saying earlier, um, I think that as, a, as someone who grew up in an Asian household, um, so much of what, what resonated with me about Chang's story and the film as well is, is not what was actually said. Because there, there are things in great detail, but it's actually the things that weren't spoken. Um, and I think there's this very nonverbal way of communicating, at least in my household. And I think a lot of, a lot of other people who have grown up in a similar way um, have shared that, where that generation um, had a different way of interacting with their children than probably, you know, than Chang does with his kids, for example. Um, and that's something that, even though it wasn't written or spelled out, it really came across in, in, in both the story and, and, and the film. Sorry, guys, I lost my Wi-Fi connection too. So I. <laughs> I thought I um, thought you, as the moderator, were just sick of us. So just like... <laughs> I got so hungry, I ran to the kitchen to get some food. All this food talk. So I mean, told it's time for us to kind of wrap this up, and I wanted to thank you, Wayne, Chang Ray, Corey, for being here, and the audience. And if you haven't seen the film, OutsiderPictures.us, you can buy a virtual ticket from anywhere in the United States and visit the few theaters that are listed there that are specifically showing the film in person as well. And look forward to uh, having you all on again for the next film. Okay, thank you so much for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, see you guys later. Good seeing you guys.